Um, if you are interested in any of our events, you're welcome to go to the HMSC homepage, scroll to the bottom, and there's a calendar of events there with all of our login information, so you can get that information at any time. But why you're all here is for our speaker. Um, I think many of you already know who's standing beside me, but this is Roy Lowe. Uh, he was employed with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for more than 37 years. Uh, 30 years of those? Yeah, we're here at Hatfield. Mm -hmm. um, and he was the refuge manager for the Oregon Coast National Wildlife Refuge Complex. Um, he's been retired since 2015, even though from what little I see. I don't think retirement <laughs> quite describes what he's been doing. Um, he lives in Walport and he continues to do work monitoring the migratory birds here in Lincoln County. And he's gonna be sharing his work with us today. So I'm gonna hand it off to Roy. Roy, do you wanna make your mic go live? Uh, great, I think we're ready to go. Thank you and thanks for the uh, invitation to speak today. Um, I'm gonna to talk about two species of birds that if you will, one is in the backyard of the Marine Science Center and one is sort of in the front yard. And the first one is snowy plovers. And this view you see here on the title slide is something I never thought I would see in Lincoln County, a flock of snowy plovers. So we'll start off with the diminutive snowy plover. It's the smallest species of plover in the world. And in 1990, there were fewer than 50 birds remaining on the Oregon coast. And that's the year that annual monitoring began for snowy plovers. The coastal population from Washington all the way down to Baja is considered a distinct population that was listed as a threatened species in 1993. Snowy plovers like open ephemeral sandy habitat to, to breed in uh, at large beaches and dune areas with sparse vegetation. They use crypsis or camouflage to, um, to have their nest and this allows them to detect predators at great distance and escape uh, and if you were walking down the beach and this bird was on a nest it would likely be a long ways away from the nest by the time you spotted it they're pretty pretty sneaky uh, during the day the female incubates the normally three egg clutch sometimes it's just two eggs but she incubates all day long and then at night the male incubates the egg so it's a shared duty but upon hatching, the female is done with parental care and she leaves the chicks to the male. And she's likely to go to another site and breed with another male and have a second clutch. So the male uh, raises these chicks that are up and running around when they're just a few hours old. And here on the far left, you see the adult male and he's leading these three chicks on the far right uh, down the beach. So he doesn't feed them, he leads them to food sources, sources and shows them how to how to forage. I was amazed when I found out that these birds could breed at the age of nine to 10 months. I would have never guessed that, but when you consider their average life span on the Oregon coast is 2.9 years, you really got to get started early if you're going to maintain your, your population. If a bird reaches four years of age in Oregon, it's likely to make it all the way to 10 years. So it's that first three years that heavy mortality of birds. And then once they get past that point, they have a high likelihood of surviving to 10. And this last fall, a brother and sister broke the Oregon record. They each made it to 15 years, two months, and they haven't been seen since, so. Okay, the reasons for the decline, the, the really big one is the loss of breeding habitat. And uh, hopefully you saw the lecture last month by Rebecca Mostow, who described the introduction of beach grass and how it dramatically changed our beaches forever. Uh, and um, so big open beaches now are very, very narrow. On that narrow stretch of beach we have now, we have ever increasing humans recreating and doing things, which causes disturbance for these birds. And now we have many more predators that key on food that people provide, either directly feeding them on the beach or leaving food behind or trash and things like that. So we have the three things that uh, really is responsible for this bird just about disappearing from Oregon. So under the uh, habitat conservation plan that was developed, they identified management areas in Oregon where they would manage these three, three problems uh, for plovers. And if you look at that chart, you'll see that Lincoln County has no designated management areas. And the reason for that is there's very, very little opportunity to restore habitat for these birds in this county. And secondly, the social economics of closing the beaches in, in this area and doing predator management was pretty heavy. 
Uh, can you imagine closing South Beach or Bayshore or Agate Beach? And quite frankly, some of the long-term plover biologists told me that they never envisioned that we'd see this many plovers uh, in Lincoln County. These birds have outperformed what the biologists thought they would, they would do. So in these management areas, they're doing habitat restoration. And here you see the uh, New River. It's uh, in Coos County. The uh, Curry County line is about two, two miles in the distance. And they bulldozed down the big four dune that was present, uh, covered with ammophila, and created these open sandy uh, nesting areas. They're doing predator management in these areas. And uh, their raven is one of the uh, species that it's a very intelligent bird and they have learned the ropes on how to exploit snowy plovers. And so they're doing lethal control of birds and mammals. They're not going out and just willy nilly killing animals. They're going after, they're targeting animals that have learned to prey on snowy plovers. And in case of birds, it's things like ravens and crows, few cases gulls. And interestingly enough, some Northern Harriers have learned how to, how to forage, not on no, necessarily the plover themselves, but the eggs. And then some of the mammals that uh, are a problem are ever increasing uh, coyote population foraging on the beaches. And along the south coast, uh, red foxes are a particular problem down there. <clears throat> and they're non-native to the coastal area of Oregon. So in management areas, they also do what they can to keep these, these uh, predatory birds away from uh, snowy plovers. And so when carcasses wash ashore, in the management areas, they're either removed or buried so they don't attract these birds. Here you see some turkey vultures. They're not a, a problem for snowy plovers, but this carcass down at Bayshore, at times I've seen up to seven ravens on it, and you can see tracks just radiating out from this carcass where they forage in the area. So uh, that's something that's done in the, in the management areas. So uh, in the management areas, they're closed uh, seasonally from March 15th to September 15th. So no vehicles of any kind allowed, um, no dogs, no kites, and people and horses can only pass along the beach on the wet sand. So you can only imagine how controversial this was to uh, establish this program on Oregon's uh, beaches. Uh, but it, Making it through that process, the reality is this covers about 14% of the Oregon coastline. So it's not a huge area of the coastline to seasonally uh, manage for plovers. This shows uh, four of the management areas on the north coast, Clatsop Spit, Nehalem Spit, Bay Ocean Spit at the mouth of Tillamook Bay, and then uh, most recently they've begun nesting at uh, Sand Lake. Um, and so the red areas are those areas that are closed, as I described previously. You'll see at Clatsop Spit, they have a yellow area where dogs are allowed to be on leash. And then the green areas nearby supporting uh, plovers uh, is an area where leases, the leash of your dog is optional, but it's supposed to be under voice control. And this particular uh, issue uh, kind of sticks in my craw. Um, and let me show you what some people think voice control is. Um, this is a scene I see every day that I'm on the beach, that there's dogs off leech and there's birds. These dogs are incessantly chasing them. Now, these aren't plovers. These are other shorebird species. But these birds are trying to make it from the Arctic to South America and back. And they burn up these uh, fat reserves being chased. And in this case, these guys were yelling for the dog to chase them and having a good time. And so, um, like I said, it's, it's a very common practice to see. Uh, there was one day I actually saw two women trying to, chain, cha uh, trying to train their dog to chase shorebirds. And it was a corgi, and it wanted nothing to do with those birds. And I thought, right on, we need more of that dog breed. <laughs> so I'm kind of digressing here, but I wanted to bring this up because it's a real, real issue in our beaches. And if you're a dog walker, please leash your dog if there's birds anywhere in the area. So the, recover the recovery criteria for snowy plovers range wide. Uh, they wanted to have 3,000 breeding birds, and in recovery unit number one, which is Oregon and Washington, 250 breeding birds, and that's 200 for Oregon and 50 for Washington. And then both for recovery unit one and range-wide, uh, the other requirement was one chick fledged per adult male for five years, and then long-term habitat protection. So how are they doing? Well, range-wide, we're up to about 2,200 breeding birds, which is really good. Uh, Oregon and Washington met their goal in 
uh, a decade ago. And uh, we haven't yet fledged one chick per uh, male for five years in a row, uh, range wide. But again, Oregon and Washington a decade ago met that criteria. Is this, I, how do I get rid of this thing? Oh, there we go, okay. Um, and then uh, long-term habitat protection, we need more work range wide. Um, there are plans across all jurisdictions in Oregon and Washington, which is really good. But the only caveat here I would say is that it can't just be habitat protection. It's gonna be, ha be habitat management in perpetuity. We just can't say, okay, we protect the habitat, it's fine because it will evolve into something that's not suitable for plovers. Uh, this shows the six recovery units for um, snowy plovers on the West Coast. And you see that sort of orange line at the top, that's Oregon and Washington. Uh, the the y-axis is the percent recovery plan, percent of Republican uh, recovery plan goals. And so Oregon has uh, now actually exceeded the 200% goal. And then you'll see Central California and Southern California are those three lines that are kind of in the, in the middle where they're all above or are getting to the 100% goal. And then the two lines at the bottom, if you averaged them out, it's almost a flat line. And it's not hard to understand. The yellow line is San Francisco Bay, and it's easy to understand why there's issues there. But surprisingly, the gray line at the bottom is Mendocino, Humboldt, and Del Norte counties. So in the 1990s, when we only had a handful of birds remaining, the core area was uh, from Lane, Douglas, and Coos County. And you can see by 2018 through effective management, uh, birds had spread all the way north to uh, Clatsop Spit. And a little bit south in Curry County, uh, there would probably be more in Curry County, except there's not many sandy beaches, uh, dune areas down there for them. Let's look a little bit closer uh, to home here. This is the mouth of Yaquina Bay in 1939. And look at all that open, uh, sandy ephemeral habitat. I can just imagine scores of plovers using that area. Now for reference, the red arrow points to the easternmost finger jetty that sticks out into the bay. It's the longest jetty, you've probably seen it. Keep that in reference for the next photo which shows what the area looks like today. And you can see all that eastern portion of the open sanding area is in planted shore pines followed by the brownish area, which is the deflation plain, and then the high four dune that uh, the Amophila has developed in dark green. And so this is a, a low tide photo. When the tide is in, the only beach that remains is that light sandy, uh, light brown color. And so that's where we have plovers, we have people, and we have predators. Uh, similar, but for different reasons, uh, down in Walport at Alsea Bay, this is Bay Ocean Spit. You see massive open sandy area and the arrow points to the community of Walport. And this is what it looks like today with about a thousand homes that were built on uh, that Bayshore area. You can see there's open sandy habitat around all those houses there up in the upper left, but that is them unburying their houses after windstorms. And so in 2013, a the flock of snowy plovers appeared at South Beach and many of us were amazed and excited. They haven't been seen in the county in many, many years. And they started wintering at South Beach each year. Um, and then in 2017, I was looking at bird reports on Oregon birders online, a listserv. And this one guy had come over from Willamette Valley and he was looking at this rare shorebird that we had. It was, it was like May 17th. And he said, oh, and as I was leaving the beach, I saw two snowy plovers up high on the beach where you'd expect to see them. And I went, wait a minute they should be back down south in the breeding area. What are they doing here in, in middle of May? So I ruminate, ruminated on that for a couple of weeks. And I said, you know what? They're probably breeding here. And uh, so I went out and surprised myself. I found two nests in about 20 minutes. And that was kind of a big deal because they hadn't nested here for 37 years in Lincoln County. And the, the last documented nests were done by Ruth Wilson, who did her uh, master's thesis here through OSU studying uh, snowy plovers. So this kind of started my odyssey on uh, snowy plovers. I got hooked at, uh, at looking at them and following them along. So after I found these nests, I was immediately uh, uh, sent to Oregon Department of, uh, Oregon Parks and Recreation Department, State Parks. And uh, this is uh, Doug Sustretch. And we 
roped off and signed this nest. So outside of management areas, the only thing that the state has to do is put a protection zone around the nest itself, uh, 50 yards from the nest. And um, so um, that's what we did early on. And then jump forward a few years. Um, this is uh, in 2020, I met uh, Mike and Nancy Thomas and John French, and they had recently moved here and were living in Bayshore and uh, started volunteering with lots of different programs. But one they both volunteered for was um, Coast Watch, where they did a mile of beach. And Coast Watch said, if you see snowy plovers, report them. And they did see snowy plovers. And somehow that routed back to me. And I thought, OK, well, maybe we could do better with four of us instead of three of us. And uh, I wasn't planning to be any sort of lead or anything. I was just kind of doing my own thing. But this seemed really appropriate. Now, in most cases uh, with citizen science, you identify a need or a problem, you develop a plan, a research plan or a management plan, and then you seek volunteers. So this was more or less people that had uh, like interests coming together. And um, so a little bit of background on our people. Mike uh, Thomas uh, was with the Navy for 11 years where he was catapulted off, a, off the deck, a second seater navigator on a Navy plane. His, uh, he, uh, later, he worked in artificial intelligence for Boeing and for um, uh, Xerox. Nancy worked for Xerox for 21 years and then spent eight years doing wildlife rehabilitation. And John was kind of all over the board. He started out in social uh, services, went back to school, got a master's studying Osprey, uh, was a volunteer for United Nations and was consulting with a university on wildlife issues in Iran. Then he spent the last uh, 25 years, I believe, uh, running his, uh, uh, doing the business management for his life's, uh, wife's law practice. Uh, not pictured here is Erica Kreisman. She was a big assistance to us last year. She worked for the Snowy Pullover Project for I think something like three years. And then she went back to school and she's, as I speak, she's wrapping up her master's, master's degree on snowy plovers uh, through Portland State University. And then again, Doug Setstrich was a part of our team on the South Coast here. Uh, Peter and Kathy uh, Tronc uh, Tronquet moved to uh, the Oregon coast in 2015, and they immediately started seeing these adorable little birds running up and down the beach and wondered who, what they were and how they could uh, maybe help protect these birds. And um, next, to the, next to them is um, Cheryl Horton. Some of you may know Cheryl. She got her master's degree here at the Green Science Center studying um, common MERS. Uh, she had contacted me in... Um, 2021 and wanted to be a volunteer as part of the project. And I said, great. She said, I have a friend, Megan Hoff, that would also like to help. And Megan has a, a scientific background in watershed science, and she's currently the coastal planner for Lincoln County. So Kathy and I started communicating, I think around 2018. We had birds breeding, she had birds breeding, wintering. We started trying to figure things out and then it just uh, increased from there. So having these other two people, Megan and Cheryl last year and this year really helped cover uh, the Newport area. And not pictured here is Ryan Parker. He's the state parks ranger from Yukuna Bay North. Doug is from Yukuna Bay South. And I have to say, both these guys have been very enthusiastic about protecting snowy plovers. When I first met them, I thought, oh boy, they're probably thinking this is another collateral duty that I have to do on top of everything else. But it's been, a, been really refreshing. They're very supportive. And when we report a nest, they are on it. So we go out and we look for plovers. And sometimes the best way to find them is to follow their footprints, especially in the morning when the wind hasn't started to blow. You can see these fresh footprints and they often lead you to the birds. In this case, it led me to a nest scrape. And so um, they just build a scrape in the sand. They don't bring in nest material. And uh, you can see all the footprints converge on here. And early in the season, they build a lot of these as part of their pair bonding and courtship. Uh, so they may or may not use them. They may totally nest in a different area. But if you're lucky and you take time, you can watch these birds. And here's a female excavating a, a a nest uh, site and the male is just off of the photo. Uh, they both took turns and then they went about doing their, their thing. We also report uh, banded birds. And so uh, in Oregon, uh, the band on the right leg is a plastic band and the color indicates what year it was hatched and born. So this is a 2019 bird. On the left leg is a metal band that has nine unique numbers to that bird, but they cover that with 
with colored tape. So this bird had colored tape, red tape put on, and then a strip of green on top of that. So that gives us a unique code of green over red, blue. And uh, so each, each, each uh, bird in a nest gets that same color code. So individual birds don't get their own color code. So if there's three young in a nest, all three will have the same code. So we don't know exactly which individual is, but we know where it came from and when and all that sort of thing. And uh, sometimes they, uh, they take the, in this case, they took red tape, covered the metal band. Then they put a nice little strip of uh, violet tape in the middle. So this gives us a color code of red over violet over red yellow and yellow is a 2002 a 2020 bird and it's really amazing because these metal bands are about the size of an eraser on a pencil and i have no idea how they get that nice little strip on this live bird that they're holding i could never do that um, this is a beautiful male in peak breeding plumage in the early springtime they look really dapper with kind of golden color and the black is really in height as soon as they start the nest these birds start to fade they've already faded out pretty good uh, by this time and uh, they're, they're very territorial around nest sites. When they're establishing nest sites, they'll drive other birds away. During the wintertime when they're roosting, there's lots of bickering over roosting sites. So you see a lot of this sort of activity. And you'll note both of these birds are banded. When we find a nest, uh, we document the contents, we take close-up photos, we GPS it, and then we back off and take a distance photo. So if somebody's not using GPS, they can use georeferencing in the background to figure out where the nest is before it's uh, before it's roped off. All our data is entered online. It goes in into a database, and uh, immediately we report to state parks. And sometimes the same day or the next day, or weather permitting, they'll be down roping these off. And we always try to get out there and help them because they're. Very few of them, they're very busy and they've really been hard hit during the pandemic. Their staff level is really low. So we try to get out and help them uh, put these exposures up. And on the left here, you can see Nancy and Mike uh, uh, putting up the sign and John's unfurling the, the rope on the right there. And then once this uh, enclosure's uh, constructed, we try to every three or four days go by and, and keep track of what's happening, try to follow the birds through the, through the season. So if we're uh, really lucky, uh, they'll make it to hatching. Uh, this is a female, she's still on the nest because uh, she's got one chick and the other egg hasn't hatched yet. It's in the process of pipping, but it'll be hatching, uh, hatching shortly and then she'll, she'll be out of there. Here's a male with uh, a lone chick and this picture in the next one to me shows just how vulnerable these birds are on our beaches with all these people and predators and dogs and uh, really narrow beach really tiny little guys and they've got to go something like 28 days on the beach before they actually fled so that's about the minimum so uh, there's a bird at the at the bottom of this arrow on a nest this is at south beach before it got roped off and you can see the wet sand is sort of the high tide line and then you see very little beach left and all sorts of tracks through back and forth through this nest this one was at uh, Yukuna Bay State Park along the North Jetty, and it's a little tough to see, but there are scads of tracks on both sides of the nest, people walking through and stuff. And amazing, these birds try to make a go of it in places like this. So in 2020, there was a pretty big uh, ocean event in terms of waves, and it really mined our beaches along the coast uh, uh, here in Newport and the Walport area. This is South Beach and it, the, the waves took out all the high beach and it undercut the fore dune pretty seriously. This is two years later, it still has not recovered. Right after it happened, that was a sheer sand wall. It's starting to slough now, but at high tide, there's essentially no beach left for these birds. And we're in our second year since this occurred. And I, we'd see this at South Beach and down uh, near Walport at Patterson State Park. So these are the areas that we concentrate our, our efforts in 2021. Uh, Team Newport was covering Agate Beach, Yaquinta Bay State Park, and South Beach. And then Team Walport were covering the areas basically from uh, Quail Street and Seal Rock south to Alsea Bay. There was a number of stretches there where birds uh, had attempted to nest in the past. And this is the result of our 2021 season. You could ignore the white text, which is just symbols for our nest sites. 
And the black numbers are the number of nests we found at each site. So at Aggie Beach, we had four nests, eight at Yaquinta Bay State Park, two at South Beach State Park. Then you drop down to the Seal Rock and Walport area and a pretty good concentration of nests down there. Uh, nine at Fox Creek, 13 at uh, Sandpiper Village, and then Bayshore down near the mouth, uh, seven nests. And uh, sharp-eyed <clears throat> Doug Sustretch uh, found a uh, couple of nests south of there. He, he found a nest, nest at Beachside State Park. Uh, and then he called me and said, hey, I, I got a really suspicious bird down here, just about where the beach ends in Lincoln County towards Yahats. He said, I think they gotta be nesting here. So I went down there and sure enough, there was, there was a nest down there. So, um, so we expanded our coverage down to include those. So we had 48 nesting attempts in Lincoln County last year, which is by far our record. The previous high was 21. And I said all this data is entered to, uh, online into a database. I wasn't sure that I would be capable of getting that information back out in the form that I wanted. So I tracked every nest on spreadsheet just for my own, own benefit. And all I want, to, want you to look at here is about three quarters of the way down, you see some red text under results. Out of those 48 nests, a single egg hatched in Lincoln County. And this is the only chick that uh, made it through hatching. Unfortunately, within 48 hours, this chick was gone. So zero production in Lincoln County last year. And we've only had small numbers of birds fledge over time. So for many of our volunteers, some of who are in the audience here today, it can be really disheartening to spend all this time and energy trying to protect these birds only to have them uh, completely fail. But I've tried to express to them that we're collecting some really, really valuable information. If you will, this is the control for all the other research and management being done. We're basically not doing anything here other than those little exclosures while everybody else is doing habitat management, predator control, human management. And so um, it's gonna be very important when this species is no longer listed as a threatened species, a lot of funding is gonna go away. They're gonna to have to make some hard decisions on how they're gonna manage this species so that it doesn't revert back to a threatened or endangered bird or disappear from Oregon. So this information we're collecting is, if you don't manage this bird, you're not gonna have it. Now, many other endangered species like peregrine falcons, uh, Lucian cackling geese, bald eagles, once they recovered, we pretty much, it gets into a monitoring situation. We don't have to do a little, whole lot, but with this species, it's gonna, it's gonna require long-term management uh, of those dunes to have habitat for them. So on the bright side of Lincoln County, it's actually a really good wintering location for, for snowy plovers. And this is uh, Bayshore. They winter in, usually in flocks. And this year I had a high count of 66, which is really, really high for any location. And there were about 40 uh, at Newport South Beach. So um, pretty amazing numbers. And they're, they're here all, all winter. And you see they're kind of crouched down low. They often, they love human footprints or horse footprints to get down in. And what they're doing is they're trying to be less obvious to predators. So they, they get down in depressions, they'll get behind shells, kelp, rocks, and try to break up their form because there are predatory birds hunting the beaches every day. This is a peregrine falcon. It's actually eating a buffalo head out at the South Jetty here. But this bird I saw often on South Beach. And so we have local birds that breed here, and then we have all kinds of birds that are passing through along the coastline. So they're a threat to um, snowy plovers. And I was out doing a winter survey this year, and this Merlin made two attempts to get, capture a snowy plover right in front of me, and then it perched on this log. And uh, I immediately left the area because I didn't want to be any part of a, bit of a successful predation event uh, for this Merlin. Um, so uh, when I see a bird with four color bands, I pretty much know it's not from the state of Oregon. Oregon in the past used four color bands, but and there may be a few birds surviving with four bands, but I've never seen one. So it's usually pretty automatic. This is the male in 2017, it hatched uh, and was banded at Graveyard Spit at Willapaw Bay. And uh, every year since then, it has wintered at Bayshore, including this year, it spends the entire winter there. The researchers in Washington affectionately refer to this bird as John Deere because of the color of bands on its right leg. This bird is a, a little bit different. This bird was born on, this is a female. The last one was a male. This female was born at New River in 2017 also, then immediately flew down to the South Spit of Humboldt Bay. And every year since it has bred at Humboldt Bay and every year since it has wintered at Bayshore in the flock uh, along with the other bird. 
This is a really interesting bird. This is green over orange, blue over blue. This bird was uh, hatched and banded in the Marina Dunes uh, in June. Uh, Marina Dunes is at the south end of, Hump or, excuse me, Monterey Bay. When it was seven weeks old, it left Monterey Bay on August 6th. Five days later, it was at Humboldt Bay South Spit. South Spit. And then five days after that, it was at Bandon Beach. And then three days after that, it was at South Beach. So pretty amazing for a seven week old bird to make this flight, but also that it hit all the major snowy plover areas along the way. And there were people there that actually saw the actually saw the bands. And I have to thank Chuck Philo for photographing this bird at South Beach. He was the only one that saw it. It, it. After that day, it was gone. So it probably continued further north. But this just shows you with uh, these, these markings, you can get some really good information on individual birds. And this is the kind of picture I like to show of people and dogs on the beach. Uh, uh, this dog is on a leash, these people are strolling along. I think both the dog and the guy in the sunglasses are wondering why the heck I'm taking their picture. But if you look closely, you'll see some white dots on the sand. And those are snowy plovers that do not feel threatened at all with these people walking this close to them with a dog on leash. And so uh, you, you would have a hard time counting them all, but there's actually seven, seven plovers sitting right there. Uh, so my, my bottom line for snowy plovers in Lincoln County is I think there's room on the beach for people and plovers too if we just, if we just do the right thing and manage them appropriately. Maybe we're not the hot spot for, uh, or maybe we're not a breeding site at all uh, for the species, but we certainly are an important wintering location. So now I'd like to switch to the backyard of the Marine Science Center and talk about uh, Pacific Black Brant. And uh, myself and Chuck Philo have been watching these brant for the last three years. Uh, Chuck is uh, retired. He was a jack of all trades, all sorts of construction, managing water plants and so forth. And late in his life, he became a birder. And man, is he a good birder. He's out almost every day finding some really great stuff. And we wanted to look at brant, brant particularly me, because in the 1970s and 80s, there were about 400 brant that wintered here at uh, Yaquina Bay. And when my former office started looking at uh, Brant in the 1990s, that was down to around 200 birds. And so I wondered, you know, what's happening now? And so uh, Chuck and I have uh, taken, a, taken a pretty good look at, at these birds. So it's a very small goose. And there's a size reference here. You see in the lower right, a male pintail duck. So Brant are pretty close to the same size, only a lot bulkier than a the pintail. So they're a very small goose. They're only found in marine and estuarine habitats. They are long distance migrants, so they're coming in from a long way, breeding in the Arctic and subarctic areas. These are some of the major breeding areas along the Arctic coast of Alaska. Uh, there are birds that breed on Wrangell Island, the Russian mainland that come this way, and then Yukon Delta has a sizable number of breeding birds. And then the entire world population of black brant funneled down to Eisenbeck Lagoon at the uh, tip of the Alaska Peninsula where they stage. Uh, and there's massive eelgrass beds there that's their primary forage, both in the lagoon itself and surrounding estuaries. And then the birds that migrate, a large percentage of the birds leave there nonstop headed to the uh, Gulf of Mexico or to Baja, California. Other smaller groups like ours they take a different route and, and end up at places like Yaquina Bay. So are, there are three wintering locations for Black Brant in uh, Oregon, Tillamook Bay, and Etarts Bay, and Yaquina Bay. Formerly, uh, decades ago, there was a wintering population, uh, uh, population at Coos Bay, but that is no longer the case. Although it's a really important spring staging area where up to a thousand Brant might be found on their way back where they stop to feed on the eelgrass. So eelgrass is vitally important to Brant. The vast majority of their diet is eelgrass. And so if you don't have eelgrass on a wintering area, staging area, you don't have Brant. And uh, I was alarmed when last October, I listened to Jim Caldy's talk here at the Marine Science Center about the huge decline of, of eelgrass here in Yaquina Bay and elsewhere along the West Coast. That, that was really alarming. I had no idea that was, that was happening. So these brant will feed on the eelgrass at low tide. When the water is not too deep, they can tip up and feed on it. And then once it's flooded, uh, they swim around looking for eelgrass leaves floating on the surface and continue, continue foraging. They do eat other things. We see them occasionally eating sea lettuce or ulva, 
Uh, I've seen them eating um, herring eggs during the spawn, but without the eelgrass, you don't have uh, brant. So uh, this is right off the Marine Science Center Trail. I'm sure most of you recognize this. And uh, so the best time to watch these brant is on an incoming tide. Their last used area is out there, what we call the mound, this high area you see out there, and all those large black dots are brant. So I can start, start counting them when they're out there. And then, um, and then they swim to shore or some will fly to shore. Uh, but a lot of times it's very aggravating because one of these beautiful bald eagles will come over and scare the devil out of these brant. And so just when you're starting to collect some good information, they're all up and they're gone. And sometimes they leave and they don't come back and it can be very frustrating because you only have so many days of the right tide and right weather and all that. But if you're patient, a lot of times they'll fly all the way down to the LNG plant, circle around and come back and land. So, um, and when they come back, it's funny, the first birds that reach the beach run along the beach and look for any wind road uh, uh, eelgrass. And then uh, once they finish that, they'll roost and they'll preen and they'll kind of hang out uh, as the tide increases. It's interesting, all winter long, we see bickering in the flock. It, it's never a day where it's total calm. It must be very stress, stressful to be a brand. And I think a lot of this is when uh, some guy gets too close to another guy's gal, he drives him away, or if you get too close to somebody else's family. And so this, this kind of goes on all the time. It's fun to watch, but uh, I wouldn't want to be a brand. And if you look closely, you can actually pick out four color banded brand in this photo. There are four green bands. And so um, unlike snowy plovers, these bands have a coat on them. So we know exactly who the individuals are. Here you see a bird with a green band on the right leg and a metal band on the left leg. And these metal bands have nine numbers. So we know exactly who that bird is. If it doesn't have a metal band or loses the plastic band. This code is a pretty easy one to read. It's OZK, and the last three years we've been watching it. It's been here every year, wintering at uh, Yaquina Bay. This is a, bird, a pair of birds that are male and female. They're a mated pair, and this is S plus T and S plus three. And so if I'm not familiar with the bird, I always take lots of photographs because they don't just use alphanumeric codes. They use uh, greater than symbols, dollar signs, hearts, uh, all kinds of stuff. And so that can be kind of hard to tell if you're looking through binoculars, but it's pretty easy when you, when you take a photo. So green band, oh, here's, here's another one, equals S2. And I don't know, you probably can't see it from this, that distance, but you can actually read three of the numbers on the metal band that says 332. I'll talk about that in a second. So all the green bands come from the Colville River on the Alaska Arctic coastline, kind of in the center of their coastline. And today that's the number one brant breeding area in the Arctic up there. Uh, so when our office was studying these birds back in the 90s, most of the wintering birds here had bands from Prudhoe Bay, uh, but they no longer, they have abandoned at Prudhoe Bay for 20 years. I guess we're all past that oil development stuff. And uh, so we still could have birds from Prudhoe Bay here. They're just not, not banded. And then this year we had three young of the year birds show up with bands. And this was a, this was a great sign because we saw no new birds during the 2021 winter because nobody was banding in COVID. Research was stopped in Alaska. And so there's no marking. So when we, these birds arrived, I thought, okay, we know they're doing their, their thing up there. And so this is black band dollar sign 76 and yellow band 5HJ and 5RJ. And these three young of the year birds came from the, the Yukon Delta. Now they're different colors because they're part of different research projects. So uh, I don't know the whole details on that, but um, those three young birds arrived together and they stayed together all year before they, they went back. So Chuck and I saw three different birds with just metal bands and two of them were obviously paired. They were always together. When you saw one, the other bird was literally within two or three three feet of it and here they're they're roosting together so we thought let's see if we get close enough and take enough photos to read the numbers on those bands and to my amazement it only took us three days three good days to get this it was hundreds of photos but we eventually completed all nine numbers on each band and then I was a bit astonished when I got the band returns for these birds because they came from Banks Island Canada far east of, uh, of Alaska and when I submitted these to the bird banding lab, I got this auto reply back. Uh, can't, this is a very unusual sighting. Can you provide more information? And I think that was, that was code for, can you prove this? <laughs> so I sent them the photos. I said, you look at the numbers. 
Uh, but th this is pretty amazing because these brant have to file, uh, fly a minimum of a thousand miles to the west before they make a left turn and fly south because brant do not fly over land unlike other geese species. So they fly along the coastline or over the open ocean. So I hazard to guess that these birds actually flew south to hit the mainland and flew along the coastline. So it's probably a lot farther than a thousand miles before they uh, start down uh, to the south. The Canadian biologist told me that these two birds were only part of uh, 200 that they had banded. So I thought it was a pretty big deal to see two at one location. I said, I think they're pretty, I'm pretty sure they're paired. And when I get the banding data, sure enough, one is a male and female, a banded same day and all that. And uh, the second year they came back this year, they had three young in tow. There's three young here, the females on the left, the males in the middle. And the Canadian researchers had told me that they rarely find young in the birds they banned on Banks Island. They had some the theories for that. So I was pretty excited when we had these three here. Now the kind of downer part of it was after a month, the female disappeared and we never saw her again. Uh, but the young of the year stayed with the male and survived the winter to go back with him. So it'll be interesting to see if he comes back next year, if he comes back with a different female, uh, if we can even find them or read the band. But, um, you see these young of the year, see the white stripes or white tips on their wing feathers, their secondaries and coverts. That's an easy way to identify young. Here's a close up. You see the white tips on those uh, wing feathers. The white on the side of the breast is pretty subdued. The neck ring's not really bright. Um, this is an easy way to tell a bird that was born last summer. And here's a picture of adults. See no, no striping on the, on the wings, pretty, pretty bold white marks on the side. And, really fancy, fancy necklace. So this allows us to get an age ratio on these birds. And so I, I did a count this year and came up with 31.3% young in a flock. I thought, that's great, but how does, how does that relate? Is that, is that really good? Is it bad? So I looked through the data from Alaska and 54 years of data from Eisenbeck Lagoon where they all stage in the fall, their average was 24% young in the flock. So I thought, okay, that's really good. We're, we're above average. <laughs> So in 2000, uh, a little bit of a summary, there were a lot, around or less than 200 wintering birds. Early fall migrants, we had stopovers of banded birds that would stop here, spend some time at Yaquina Bay, and then continue on. In the springtime, we would get birds coming back and joining the flock, wintering flock here at Yaquina Bay. And by springtime, I mean late January, we had birds coming back in. And so at that point, it was too late to figure out what our wintering population was. We really had to do it before mid-January. Mid now we jump to the present. In 1994, our peak count, uh, I mean, uh, excuse me, in 2021, our peak wintering count was 94 birds. And then this last winter, 137. So again, our numbers are down from uh, uh, where they were in uh, two decades ago. Uh, we did, have not detected any fall migrants stopping and joining the flock. Uh, and no spring arrivals detected, which kind of surprised me. We're not seeing any influx of birds that stop and join these birds. Now, there's a caveat to this last uh, statement here on the present is about three to four weeks after our birds left, 16 birds showed up here at uh, Yaquina Bay. In fact, one of them was sporting fishing line and the sinker on its leg. So when it's flying around, it was pretty much hanging, out, hanging down. Um, and just before I came to this talk, I went out there and there's still 13 birds out there. But these birds are, are heavily molting. They're probably younger birds. They're not going back to Alaska. They're gonna molt down here. And so uh, they didn't in any way affect our, our wintering population numbers uh, this year. And here you can see S plus T and S3 together, always traveling together. And you can't tell, but this bird on the right has a black band and it's S1 asterisk. And I, if you ever band birds, don't put an asterisk on your bands because that immediately becomes a dot. So um, kind of the summary on Brant is, we were really concerned about the, the continuing decline of Brant at Yaquina Bay, not knowing really what it's from. Um, overall, the population is doing great. There's 157,000 birds in the flyway and they were annually increasing. Now my data only goes back to 2019 because you know, the pandemic sort of turned everything upside down. I haven't seen the most recent data, data, but increasing, doing really well. Four decades ago, it was kind of a big deal. There were like six to 8,000 brants that stayed at Eisenbeck Lagoon and the surrounding estuaries and didn't come south. And uh, in 1999, sorry, 2019, uh, 
reverse that, 2019, 50,000 Brant stayed at Eisenbeck Lagoon. And so that's probably a climate change uh, effect. And it very well may that, be that some of those birds that stayed at Eisenbeck would have normally come to Yoquinta Bay. So really pretty hard to tell uh, why the number continued to decline here, although I'm concerned about the loss of eelgrass beds. So that concludes my presentation. Thank you so very, very mm -hmm. much. Um, so I just wanna start with, is there any questions online? Okay, I think we have a question in the room. Hang on just a second. That was a great talk. Um, very, enter enter really entertaining. Um, how much of the habitat, of, especially the nesting habitat of the snowy plover, is anything like it was? So there are all the places that they seem to be doing well is on these remotest parts of beaches. And then, of course, the beaches are being cut. But because of the dune grass, the beaches are couldn't be as wide as they once were. How wide? I mean, if the beach was even a little bit wider, wouldn't would there do you think that their nesting success would go up all other things being the same? Yeah, there's no there's no natural beach anywhere in Oregon to 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 go from. That that photo I showed at New River, those those areas there are are producing really well. And there's a big area of the north spit of Coos Bay that they're managing, continually managing, and they're producing good numbers of birds, but it's something you got to stay on. I, I'm sure you know, the minute you stop managing it, that Mophila is back, back again, the roots go down 10 or 12 feet. And I mean, it's just a nightmare plan. And now we learn from Rebecca that we have a hybrid between two species. And uh, so, uh, so it takes effective management. And, and the South Coast beaches, there's not the socioeconomic clashes that we would have if we closed you know, South Beach. Some of those areas, New River, it's tough to get to. It's a long ways away. Uh, North Spit of Clues Bay, it's tough to get out to. So, um, so it, it takes us habitat. We're never going to see a natural situation, you know. Um, but um, we just had, they just found seven nests this year so far at, uh, at uh, the mouth of Tillamook Bay, and they haven't nested there for quite a while. So there's encouraging signs, but it's going to take long term management. We can't walk away from it like a lot of other listed species. We pretty much said, oh, great. Whew, that was tough. We did our job. But this one, this one we can't. Sounds like we have a question online, Michael. Rob, we have a question from Dawn Harris. With the loss of eelgrass beds in Yakuna Bay, what are they eating as an alternative? I think for right now, there's, there's enough eelgrass for 137 birds to, to forage on. Um, so I'm not concerned with uh, the, the size now, but if it continues to decline, then it would become become very serious um uh, but if we lose the grass or it gets down to a minimal amount i think these brant will go elsewhere even though they're you know they seem to be tied to wintering here if food becomes a, an issue they they will go elsewhere any other questions in the room okay hang on one second uh roy you'd think the plovers might be doing better in northern california what do you think going on there i don't know what's going on the the plover people i've talked to in oregon say it's surprising that they're not doing better in those areas because there's a lot of effort at south humble bay south south spit of humble bay and some other areas up there uh, so i don't know what all the issues are i know there's production at point Reyes, marin county uh and the national seashore down there um but um i'm not familiar enough to know why why their, their numbers are suppressed as compared to everywhere else. So at San Francisco Bay is understandable. They're breeding on salt pond dikes, you know, there's people and predators, and, uh, but I, I'm, I, I really don't know on that North Coast area. Michael has a question for online. By flood now. So first, Arlene Myrens, do you know if or how the current outbreak of avian flu is affecting these populations? Diseased waterfowl recently observed in Eugene, apparently. We don't know, but we're really, really worried. In fact, I spoke with a plover biologist this morning, and the core area down in Lane, Douglas, and Coos County, the number of birds is down. They're hoping it's a late season. You know, this weather has been terrible for plovers and everything else, including us. Uh, but um, 
they're concerned because they're not seeing the same number of females returning to nesting sites. And they, they question, are we seeing effects of avian influenza? And avian influenza does affect shorebirds seriously. So that is a, that is a serious concern. Hang on one second. I've got another question in the room. Thanks, Wright. Yeah. Phenomenal talk and great work. I'm Thanks. curious about the Lincoln County. I mean, you've seen things in the places that you've been monitoring. Obviously, there's a few places you're not monitoring and weren't there. And so I'm wondering if you think that there may be some, you know, nesting or overwintering in those areas as well. Well, one, one, that's a good question. Uh, one of the things that I, kind of rescues me from that, because the, some of our volunteers here, we can't cover all these beaches, but those two state park rangers, when they see something, they tell us. And so I've had a report of birds at the tip of the spit at Sletts Bay and went up there and sure enough, there was a banded bird there that had come down from Tillamook County. And so even though we're not cover them, they're always on the outlook. And if they see anything, they let us know. And, you know, they're driving to beaches as opposed to us walking miles and miles. So you know, there could be a nest show up here and then disappear, and there may be a few birds here, but I don't think we're missing anything uh, in, in any big way because of their efforts. Okay, so uh, during your talk, Roy, um, Fran Reich from Pacific States Marine Fisheries had this question. Um, it's about the potential restoration site at Camp West Wind on the Salmon River. I think uh, Fran was just wondering about that. She thought that maybe that was, she just had that question during your talk and she said, I thought there was a restoration site there. Uh, if they're doing restoration there, it's not for snowy plovers. Uh, I'm not aware of any restorations. There could be something going on, but it would not be for snowy plovers. They're not doing restoration outside of management areas. They, they can't do all the restoration they need to do there let alone going outside. And I'm familiar with that beach that it could produce a few plovers. It's not a real big area, but so I'm, I, if there's any sort of habitat restoration going on there, it's not associated with plovers. Okay, any other questions in the room? Great, go for it, Michael. Sorry. Um, so Mackenzie Pudham asks this, what effects were seen on the snowy plover at Driftwood during the wave energy project? Um, they, uh, Erica Kreisman, who was one of our Walpart team members, she was specifically hired to look at that to make sure that there was no impact from that. So they were closely monitoring that. And we ended up, we had one nest show up in the zone I think it was one nest that showed up in the zone where they were drilling out. Uh, of course, it was all underground and it really didn't have much effect. And that nest didn't survive very long. It was built really low on the beach and it got swept away by high waves. Uh, so the state was required to monitor throughout that project to ensure that it didn't impact any snowy plovers. And as far as we can tell, it didn't. All right, I think it's time to say thank you to Roy. And to the volunteers that are in this room, thank you very, very much for your efforts. We appreciate you. I think unless the students have found it, there's some cookies left outside if you're here on site. So feel free to grab a cookie um, and maybe we'll see you next week um, at our next seminar. So thanks everybody. And thank you, Roy.